Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Ferreira, and I'm the program manager uh, for the Immune Deficiency Foundation. And thank you so much for joining us today. Before we get started um, with today's session, I did want to go over uh, a few reminders. First, please remember that each patient's treatment and condition is unique. The content presented in the session should not be used as a substitute for professional medical advice. And in all cases, patients and caregivers should consult their healthcare providers. Also remember that where you are on your journey on living with primary immunodeficiency may differ from that of others in the community. The severity of primary immunodeficiency can vary, and we ask that you are supportive and respectful of one another as fellow members of the IDF community. Finally, any questions that you have for our presenter, um, please submit them via the question box listed on the side of your screen. These questions will be answered during our live Q&A. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Roger Kobayashi, who is going to speak on PI and the golden years long-term effects of PI. Uh, Dr. Kobayashi is a longtime friend of IDF, and we are so excited to have him join us. He has served for the past 25 years on the volunteer faculty at the University of California, Los Angeles. He is a clinical professor. Uh, he is on um, the full-time faculty at the University of Nebraska. Um, and his outside passions include his family, three grandchildren, Hawaii and golf, and I'm sure he will mention that in his presentation. <laughs> Dr. Kobayashi, <laughs> what a pleasure, it is now yours. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, remarkably, the weather in Nebraska is very good. It's 78 degrees and sunshine. So it's almost like Hawaii. And so what I'd like to do is thank the IDF for all of the work that they've done all these many years, 40 years to be exact. Uh, and uh, I regret the fact that we could not do this uh, live uh, in Washington, D.C. I was commenting to our colleagues that I would rather be eating crab cakes in Washington than eating beef in Nebraska. Uh, and then also, I don't know if they are allowing us to see, but since this is a uh, we're talking to the 50s generation. I'm wearing my Buddy Holly glasses. So if we can go on, what we're gonna be talking about is primary immune deficiency in the geriatric age group. And I think there are a couple of important points we'd like to make before we start. Number one, obviously, primary immune deficiency is not rare, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Secondly, primary immune deficiency is not rare in the geriatric age, and we'll show you that uh, information. Thirdly, geriatric patients have unique issues that present them not only in terms of the fact that their immune system gradually weakens over age, but they have a number of comorbid diseases such as heart disease, high blood pressure, arthritis, kidney disease, et cetera. And then finally, and I think the most important point is that we really need to recognize this group. We need information on their characteristics so we can recognize their unique problems and we can better address uh, their needs. I would argue that their needs are not being met. And so this can be called a call to action. And for those of you who are interested, there's the old man in the sea. Uh, the picture is by Herb uh, Kane or Kane, uh, who is from Hawaii. Uh, and you can see this wonderful painting so just again, mahalo nui loa, which means thank you in Hawaii to the Immune Deficiency Foundation and others. Uh, Ashley gave a little background. I've been a clinical immunologist for over 40 years, training under Dr. Steam uh, at UCLA. I follow about 300 patients uh, on IVIG in an 11-state area and teach at those institutions and have been supported by grants, as you see there. And so why, why do we talk about this? Well, clearly immune deficiency was recognized in children and babies. And in fact, the Japanese saying, koromo no tatami ni, what that means is for the sake of the children, you can see that. And obviously the Immune Deficiency Foundation and a number of researchers dating back to Dr. Robert Good and others have focused their uh, efforts and research on the very young. However, we are beginning to appreciate, and this is the other Japanese word, okage-sama-de, and don't ask me to talk anymore because I'm fourth generation 
Japanese, Japanese American, and I can count to 10, and that's about it. But what Okage Sama Day means, I am what I am because of you. And I think it's important, just as we cherish our children in America, so must it be that we cherish the elderly, for they are the foundation for which uh, made America a great and compassionate nation that it is. And in the Japanese concept, it is a debt and obligation that we can never repay. Okay, so I think uh, I, I'm uh, not quite the Elvis age, but uh, close. I was a chubby checker age, but still, I mean, you can see uh, the Fonz and the fabulous 50s. And you remember when we were rocking and, you know, now that a lot of us are getting older, uh, we're knocking and we're aching. And I could remember when I was young, my mother used to complain when she got up. She said, boy, you know, the bad thing about getting old is your bones ache. And I thought that was funny. Well, now when I get up, it takes me about five minutes to get going. So the question is, what happened to us? And the thing is that the outline of the discussion, one, primary immune deficiency is not rare in the geriatric group. In fact, I would argue that because of age and the immuno senescence of the immune system, in other words, it gets old and it deteriorates, all of us may have really some form of immune deficiency. And I think all of us can remember, if you look at the top picture, we're shiny and new and charging around. And if you look at the bottom one, wow, look at us now. We're the 1960s BMW with the wheels coming off, the paint rusting, and no fender or bumper. So the thing is that older patients, one of the things that we have to remember is that most of the older patients will have antibody abnormalities, and we'll talk more about this uh, later. And because of that, it may be very difficult to diagnose. The other thing is that older individuals may present with something else besides recurrent or severe infections, but rather autoimmune disease. Some of them can present with cancers and lymphomas. Others can present with gastrointestinal problems. In addition, the older patients may have concurrent or pre-existing diseases which number one, may disguise, complicate, or impact uh, primary immune deficiency and makes it much harder to recognize and also to treat. I've already talked about aging, which causes deterioration and loss of the function, and this will be reviewed. And older patients, as I said earlier in the discussion, have problems uh, involving care. They're much more difficult to care for. They have many other health problems besides primary immune deficiency. And as you have seen, uh, insurance is a huge issue. So let me give you four very brief case reports. And I think this, is, uh, this slide or this patient will demonstrate that number one, primary immune deficiency is very difficult to diagnose and goes on for years without diagnosis, oftentimes with complications. And even after you diagnose these patients, right under your nose, more complications may come up. And so I think this is an important point that we would like to make. And here you can see this individual, when I first saw her, was 61 years old. She had at least 16 episodes of severe uh, pneumonia since childhood. So you know that she had primary immune deficiency probably as a child or teenager. And subsequently, in her older age, she continued to have chronic infections, finally admitted to the hospital, found to have bronchiectasis, and we were consulted, and we found out that she had very low immunoglobulins, and to make matters worse, she had very low T cells as well. We treated her, she did well. Unfortunately, she developed heart disease. She was infused at one of the university hospitals, and they were in a rush to get her out of the, the uh, infusion centers, so they infused her much quicker than we had uh, ordered. They put her in congestive heart failure, and this was a problem. The take-home message is that infusing older individuals have risks, and number two, a lot of times if you're not careful and you rush, and this happens in large hospitals, institutions where they want to get you as, out as fast as possible, this can cause problems as well. And we'll talk a little bit later about how complex our healthcare system is, and as a result of that, we have problems coordinating. Subsequently, she developed parotid lymphoma. She was on chemotherapy. Uh, she got over that, and then she was getting infused, like I say, at another institution, a university hospital, and then we did not find out that she was, 
she developed renal failure and was on dialysis. Because she was on dialysis, they stopped infusing her for a period of five months, and we secondarily found out, and then we started treating her subcutaneously. So this is an important thing. Number one, they can have primary immune deficiency for a long time. Number two, uh, they can have complications that are not appreciated and treatment may be more difficult. And number three, you have to have coordination between the groups as you have seen. So here are two more, another one on the left. This was a patient again. And the point here is that sometimes you can have highly skilled in caregivers managing these individuals who are getting subcutaneous gamma globulin at home, but because of the complications that they have in diseases. In this individual, uh, she ha her husband was a physician. Unfortunately, she developed inflammatory bowel disease, which required immunosuppressive. She subsequently developed cancer, which required chemotherapy. She developed liver disease with edema and ascites. Uh, she could not tolerate the medications for inflammatory bowel disease, which was getting out of hand. So we suggested high-dose IVIG, which has been used to treat refractory uh, uh, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, but we could not give it to her because of the edema, et cetera. And so the point of this is we had her use Hycuvia where we could give large doses subcutaneously. And the take home message besides the fact that they have all kinds of complications is that you have to think of novel ways of treating these individuals. The one on the right uh, shows that again, uh, uh, individual, the husband was uh, the caregiver was a retired Supreme Court justice, uh, and he was taking care of her. Unfortunately, she had other health problems like severe back pain. Uh, I diagnosed uh, Addison's in her because she had weakness and electrolyte abnormalities. Unfortunately, he had, he, the husband had a stroke, could not take care of her. We had to move her, uh, well, they, the doctors had to move her into a nursing home, and the nursing home could not do infusion. So you can see the difficulties that we run into in trying to take care of these patients. And so why, why would a pediatrician, I was trained as a pediatrician because back in the old days, the only way you could become an immunologist was to do it through the pediatric tract because the idea was immunodeficiency was a disease of infants and children. Here you can see uh, five years ago, I had another patient who was sent to me by a pulmonologist, a wonderful 78 year old with all the problems of chronic uh, uh, primary immune deficiency, which was not diagnosed. We diagnosed her, we started her on sub Q. The husband took care of her. He was an absolute saint. She began to perk up, become much more active and happy. Every time they came, they were cheerful. Unfortunately, the husband developed Alzheimer's and she, the roles reversed. She began to worry about him and she withered away and died. And this case not only made me, uh, bothered me, but it caused me to wonder how many of these patients were we following? How were they taking care of themselves? What other diseases did they have? How did these diseases affect their primary immune deficiency? And more importantly, how were they managing? And it turns out nobody knows. And so the other, the thing was that I thought, well, you know, this is interesting. Uh, you know, here are a couple of four patients that are in the geriatric age that I was following. I thought maybe I had 20 out of the 300 or so that I was following. So I asked Laura Rohi, uh, can you see how many we're following? And it turned out in our practice, there were over 80 and I was surprised. So I called my friend Ralph Shapiro in Minneapolis and Ralph said he had 80 and I called my friend Mark Stein in Florida and Mark said he had over a hundred. So it was amazing. The three of us had over 250 geriatric patients and wow, were we surprised. And since these slides will be available publicly, I won't go over the other side. So it turns out that a lot of the questions that we had, we didn't know the answer to and it turns out nobody else did either. So what we did is there's a consortium that I belong to. And what happens is that we follow about 2000 patients of which seven, little over 780 uh, 80 were registered. Uh, we're on a uh, gamma globulin replacement. And so the question we asked is how many of these patients did we have, number one, and what were the age brackets? So we split them into 10 age uh, uh, increments of uh, 10 years. So it would be less than 10, less than 20, all the way to less than 80 and above 80. 
And much to our amazement, out of these 778 patients who were on gamma globulin, 40% were, re were receiving treatment, were over 60 years of age, and only 11% were less than 20 years old. The other thing that everybody knows is that in young children and babies, male, the uh, immune deficiency is more common in males than in females. But as they age, the thing flips and females become the predominant uh, gender. So you can imagine our surprise. I mean, you can see on the right side, I don't know if my eyeballs were as big as the one you see there, but we were surprised. And just to summarize, 90% of the patients on gamma globulin uh, replacement was 20, were 20 years or older. 40% were older than 60, and there were more patients over 80 years old on IV, on immunoglobulin than there were under 10. This was a huge surprise, and we presented this data at the Clinical Immunology Society meeting, and everybody was surprised as well. Uh, here you can see, unfortunately, this is uh, the bars, and there are a couple of things. The green, these are broken down. I don't know if you can see, but on the far left, uh, which is the smallest one, there are three bars. That's less than 10. All the way to the right is the three bars greater than 80. And for some reason, uh, the green means total number of patients. And just the opposite, red is males and blue is females. So you can see early on in the less than 20 years old, so the first two uh, green bars on the left-hand side, uh, there are more uh, males, the red, than females. But you can see as they get older, it flips. And by the time you get to 60, 70, and 80 years old, the blue bar, which represents the females, the predominance of receiving gamma globulin treatment is about four times more than the males. And again, we were surprised at finding uh, this. So there were a number of critical answers, uh, I mean, questions that were not answered. And I would argue that these questions are absolutely crucial because this is an expanding population who have unique and important needs. And we need to know what are their characteristics, what are their needs, how are they being treated so that we can more effectively treat these very important individuals. So the question is, what is the incidence of primary immune deficiency in the elderly? Nobody knows. Now, interestingly enough, the USID net is collecting the data. Uh, we, we presented our data at CIS. They were very interested. Ours was antibody deficiencies. The next year, they presented at the CIS all immunodeficiencies. And it turns out that there are older individuals with chronic granulomatous disease, with Scott Aldridge, and a number of them, although antibody deficiencies are more common. How many of how many uh, of the elderly are receiving gamma globulin? Nobody knows. How many are receiving IVIG versus sub Q? Again, nobody knows. And these are critical questions because we want to know how to deliver, how to monitor these individuals, and what are the complications? Where are they getting infused? Nobody knows. If they are on IVIG, do these patients who are getting IVIG have risk factors such as high blood pressure, heart disease, strokes? diabetes, kidney problems, nobody knows again. And these are risk factors and I have seen, and I'm sure others have seen, where these individuals were getting treated and they had risk factors such as hypertension, et cetera. If they are getting sub-Q, who, are they self-infusing or is there a caregiver? And if they self-infuse today, can they self-infuse six months from now, a year from now, several years from now, when they have bad eyesight, they have arthritis, or who knows what else they have. And if you don't follow and monitor this, you don't know. Or in the case of the patient that I gave, what happens if the caregiver has Alzheimer's or the caregiver gets a stroke and cannot infuse? So these are critical questions that we need to monitor and we need to program and custom the treatment for each individual. The other question is, are they doing it properly? And it turns out some of them aren't. And are they doing it regularly? And many times they don't because they forget or they're feeling, well, this is subcutaneous gamma globulin. So they skip a dose or they prolong the dose.
Okay. So the other question that I wanted to know was how many individuals over the age of 65 were receiving IVIG? Well, it turns out there was a large uh, national company and they had 500 individuals over the age of 65 on IVIG. So that was an eye opener for me because IVIG in the elderly may be more risky. And the company made vigorous efforts to try and switch these individuals to subcutaneous uh, gamma globulin. And much to their amazement, they were able to switch only 10%. They asked, uh, I was asked, why is this so? And I said, the problem is that when we, the care, uh, we, the people who treat, tell these individuals what to do, but we don't analyze the barriers. So whenever you want to make any changes or you want to implement a program, you have to analyze who are the affected parties. In other words, who are the ball players? And it turns out you can see there the physicians, the patients, bureaucracy, insurance companies, infusion centers, etc. So in the case of uh, patients, a lot of them may be satisfied with uh, IVIG. They can meet their friends once every three, four weeks, uh, like they used to at the hair salon and chat and see what's going on. Uh, and maybe they don't want to change. Uh, in the part of the insurance uh, restrictions, there are a lot of barriers whenever you want to change. So if you want to change from IVIG to sub-Q, you have to make an application. It might trigger an audit. Uh, it's a lot more work, so nobody wants to do it. The other problem is reimbursement. If you, if you get reimbursed less for one form of treatment versus the other, uh, there might be uh, resistance to doing that. And finally, the great old inertia. In other words, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So these are questions which need answers and action. Okay, so now let's switch, uh, let's switch uh, gears. Uh, there are two ends of the spectrum, as you know, just like uh, babies and young children take a while to walk, to ride the bike, to learn how to speak and all of those things. And then unfortunately, as we get old, a lot of the functions, when you're 20 years old, you can hit the golf ball 250 yards. When you become 75 years old, good luck if you can hit it 100 yards. And the same thing happens with the immune system. So you can see uh, the baby on the right, he wish he could see the road and drive. With infants and young children, the immune system is naive, it's immature, and it's developing. And because uh, it is not... Uh, are sufficiently developed. There is an increased susceptibility to infections or responses to vaccines. That's why a number of the vaccines are conjugated and they have increased allergies because the immune system is developing and makes mistakes. On the other end of the spectrum, Old Man River has taken over. You have immunosenescence with the elderly. The immune system gets worn down. It doesn't function as well. And as a result, there's increased susceptibility to infections, poor response to vaccines. That's why we have the strong flu shot, the strong uh, shingle shot, and the worry about COVID vaccination is how will the el elderly uh, with their diminished immune system respond. In addition, because the immune system has become old and worn out and has deteriorated, we have increased autoimmunity. What does that mean? Our immune system makes more mistakes. And in addition, we don't respond by inflammation well. So you can see the old man on the right going to the GPS. How does this damn thing work? And I think many of us uh, have, have said those things to the, the, uh, the monitor in the car. I want to spend a little bit of time on immunosenescence uh, because all of us, slowly deteriorate, just like our bones, our heart, our eyesight, our lungs slowly decrease in function, our immune system decreases as well. And the lymphocytes, which are absolutely important in terms of adaptive immunity, coordinating the immune uh, response, goes down. So the T cell numbers go down as they get older. There is a decrease in naive T cells. What is the meaning of that? That means that it limits our ability to respond to new infections, new uh, antigens, 
And this is a problem. The other thing as we get older is the T cell di diversity. I think others will be talking about this, but our repertoire, in other words, our ability to respond to different kinds of new antigens or problems is diminished. The T cells actually become uh, exhausted and there are great articles in the Journal of Immunology and others where they look and our T cells and our lymphocytes actually become exhausted. They don't uh, function as well, they get fatigued and just like they get, just like we get tired of doing the same old job for 70 years, same old, same old and dealing with bureaucracy, our T cells kind of do the same thing. They've been working for a long time, they get worn out, they have limited repertoire and they just get exhausted. The same thing happens with B cells. The numbers go down, their ability to respond to different uh, and new microorganisms and antigens decrease, their ability, the antibody function decreases and their ability to bind and attach to germs, bacteria and others is decreased. We also have decreased memory cells, decreased naive cells, and unfortunately the cells become exhausted. So you can see on the right side, increased infections are a result. The severity may be worse. We may have poor response and poor surveillance. Okay, I'm, I'm going to kind of skip this because of time, but here you can see on the left, these are young, young, uh, young uh, individuals on the right are the old people. The yellow uh, cells on the top are the program ones. These are the cells that are involved in inflammation and they are programmed so they go after things without having to be taught. The blue ones are the lymphocytes. And so you can see when you're young, you have more of them. When you're old, they go down. The second one is the thymus. These are where lymphocytes learn how to become lymphocytes and then they can be released so that they can begin to respond to new things. You can see on the left, we have lots of these uh, uh, cells that are ready to learn. As we get older on the right, they go down and you can see the bone marrow with the B cells. We have lots of them when we're younger and we have less of them when we get older. The same thing with the lymph nodes. These are uh, areas which process and defend against things coming through our throat, et cetera. You can see lots of these cells on the right. And as we get older, they diminish. Okay, I'm gonna skip this uh, uh, slide. So what is the result of an aging immune system? Well, we have increased infections. Uh, so we have more problems with influenza. I, I, I think I may have given a talk on influenza earlier. 90% of the deaths due to influenza are in patients 65 and over. Uh, varicella in terms of shingles uh, is worse in the older individuals. Uh, strep pneumonia or pneumococcal pneumonia, sinus infections, et cetera, tend to be worse in the older individuals. And then our problem with good old COVID. I also mentioned earlier that there is a higher incidence of autoimmune disease as we get older. And in addition, uh, autoimmune markers tend to get, tend to increase as we go get older. Again, uh, reiterating, when we get older, we fail to make enough immune cells. The structures such as the thymus and the lymph nodes uh, shrink. Uh, and atrophy, and therefore it impairs our ability to make new cells and to respond to different kinds of new antigens or problems. The cells that are made don't work as well, kind of like our eyeballs, you know, when we we're young, uh, we could see the ball coming at 80 or 90 miles an hour, you know, now good luck if we can even see uh, the baseball coming to us. And then the cells, of course, just like people who can't hear, can't see, our cells don't respond to signals and directions as well. So you can make the analogy of our immune system kind of like our body. And nobody knows the trouble we've seen. And I don't want to go into too much details, but what happens is that our ability to get rid of old and defective cells goes down as more debris and therefore more inflammation because of all this debris. And in addition, our uh, defective cells are not cleared well. So the, in finishing up, we still fail to recognize immune deficiency. It is absolutely mind boggling that in the year 2020, after over 40 or 50 years 
Uh, we still fail to recognize immune deficiency even in children, although we're getting a lot better. Uh, we fail to recognize immune deficiency in adults. And if we think that this is not a problem, I had a patient who was 36 years old. I saw him for the first time. He was hospitalized 16 times before the, I mean, I'm sorry, six times before the age of 16 with pneumonia, kept getting infections. Finally, at age 32, somebody diagnosed him with primary immune deficiency and CVID. And by then, he had developed uh, bronchiectasis and chronic lung disease. And this was a couple of years ago. And we're still recognizing, I mean, we're still seeing unrecognized patients even today. The other problem with adults and particularly the elderly is that the elderly may have all kinds of other health problems. And if they start getting infections, it's just another thing. And so people uh, oftentimes overlook that. So the question really becomes again, why is that? Really, why is it in the year 2020 that we still cannot recognize primary immune deficiency? And part of the problem is obviously we don't recognize it when we see it. We don't think of other associated diseases which may present also as primary immune deficiency and antibiotics oftentimes describe, uh, disguise it. So primary immune deficiency and secondary immunodeficiency is right under our noses. And again, we fail to recognize it. Okay, so what about antibiotics? The antibiotics are really the miracle drugs of the last century. And antibiotics, as I've said, have saved hundreds, tens, if not hundreds of millions of lives throughout the world. I mean, can you imagine where we would be without antibiotics? Childbirth was a very dangerous thing because women would get infected, develop purple sepsis, newborns would get infected, uh, children would get pneumonia, uh, mastoiditis, uh, and all kinds of infections, ruptured appendix would uh, uh, cause infection and patients would die from infection. And antibiotics among others has made this a rare thing. The problem, as all of you know, is that antibiotics mask our ability. In other words, it delays our ability to diagnose primary immune deficiency because as you have seen with the cases I gave earlier, these individuals have been treated for 10, 20, 30, 40 years with antibiotics before somebody finally thought, well, maybe this patient is getting sick too often. Okay, so what are the misconceptions? It sounds like a broken record, but primary immune deficiency is not a disease of infants and children. Primary immune deficiency is not rare. We cannot diagnose primary immune deficiency. That's completely false. And we need to have our colleagues in ENT, pulmonary medicine, GI and et cetera, to help us out because that's where oftentimes these patients show up. We can treat primary immunodeficiency and I'm going to skip the part on the right. Uh, the audience can look at that uh, at a later date and I think this will be covered by others. The other thing is that again, the misconception that primary immune deficiency was rare and this is from the Mayo Clinic about 10 years ago and back in the 70s and 80s, you can see it was thought that primary immune deficiency was rare between one per 100,000. And then as we get up to the year 2000 to 2006, uh, you know, it's gone up almost tenfold in terms of incidence. And this is partly or mostly because of better recognition. Now, the other thing was that when I was taught and when I was a fellow, it was thought that about 40% or so was antibody deficiency and the rest were combined immunodeficiency or other things like neutrophil or, or, or uh, complement deficiencies. Well, here you can see again from the Mayo Clinic, if you look at the three bars on the left, these were the common primary immunodeficiencies that you see the big pie in children. 
But if you look at what the Mayo Clinic found, the bar on the right, almost 80% of the patients that they diagnosed with primary immunodeficiency had antibody deficiency. So antibody deficiencies, one, may be more common than we ever thought. And number two, it is often disguised because of the use of antibiotics. I'm going to skip this because uh, of time, but I think the important thing is the last three. The big problem is that a lot of these patients who have chronic sinopulmonary infections, everybody, including the physicians, think that they just have chronic lung disease, so give them inhalers and give them antibiotics, and they don't look. The other thing is that a lot of times doctors particularly accept the fact that old people or adults will get pneumonia, bronchitis, sinus problems, just give them antibiotics. This is incorrect thinking. If you, they keep getting infections, I think it is important to see why they have infections. And again, finishing up in the next couple of slides, what makes geriatric patients different? Well, we fail to recognize them, as we have said. Sometimes 30 or 40 years go on. We fail to recognize that they may have more consequences, not only because their immune system deteriorates over time, but they may have other diseases such as diabetes, which is, uh, causes e the immune system to be depressed. Uh, they may have heart disease. They may have renal disease, which can also cause uh, their immune system to be uh, compromised. We fail to recognize the impact of all these other diseases on primary immune deficiency. And unfortunately, Medicare, which is a great insurance for the elderly, comes with bureaucracy and makes it more difficult to treat. I wanna follow up a little bit uh, with IVIG. Uh, you saw earlier in the talk that 500 patients in that large national insurance company over the age of 65 were on IVIG. The company and the doctors did not know whether they had high blood pressure, heart problems, kidney problems, vasculitis, hyperosmolar, all of the risk factors which gamma globulin, uh, I mean, which might make IVIG more uh, risky. And so these things ought to be monitored, ought to be well screened at the start, monitored continuously because patients can develop renal disease over the course of treatment over several years. And also uh, we need to see if we can switch some of the elderly to subcutaneous gamma globulin, which is safer, but it, it, uh, it comes with a lot of problems of its own, including infusions, including reimbursements, including whether the older individuals can self-infuse, whether they have somebody helping to infuse the cost, the delivery, and the distribution. The complexities of Medicare and third-party payers are getting worse. The Immune Deficiency Foundation for a number of years have been working with this, and it's kind of like the Dutch boy putting the finger in the dike. Every time you patch one hole, the insurance companies or the government manages to open up other holes, but we need to keep working on them so our patients can be adequately treated. And this is kind of an important slide. And the reason is that in the old days, you just went to see Marcus Welby. Now in 2020, you see so many different doctors, you see so many different uh, clinics, it's involved with so many different insurance uh, programs. Uh, the, in Medicare, for example, Part D has over a thousand different insurance programs. How do you know which one to choose? So when I was a young, uh, when I was about five years old, my grandfather used to take me every week uh, on Saturdays to get a five cents uh, uh, ice cream cone and I'd be spinning around in the chair and life was simple. I tell you now, ice cream cones are between five and $10 and they don't taste as good as the one I remember getting with my grandfather. And we have a heck of a time trying to get patients treated in 2020 who have complicated disease or who have very expensive treatments and coordinating 
among the various different hospitals, specialists, infusion companies, and other uh, caregivers. So what should we do in finishing up? Well, first we need to recognize the fact that there are many older individuals who have primary immune deficiency, and we need to know how they are impacted by primary immune deficiency as well as the other concomitant diseases that they may suffer from. We need to know how and where these individuals are being treated and if they are monitored at all. And one of the things I don't like uh, with the way we have uh, home infusion companies is that the approval by default is a year and a lot of stuff can happen in a year. So none of, I never give any of my patients a year of gamma globulin treatment. We give it for anywhere from three to six months so that we can see them, monitor them, check their labs and make sure we don't have to have any other changes. And if they're doing fine or they need adjustments, we change their orders for the, in, in, uh, the infusion companies. We Dr. Kawiyashi, I'm sorry, I did want to interrupt to let you know we have a little under five minutes left in the session. Great, we'll finish up before then. So the, we need to find out who is taking care of them. We need to coordinate, especially in 2020, because it is very complicated. There may be five, 10 different uh, companies and institutions uh, that are involved. Uh, it is my opinion that the pharmacy services may be the one to coordinate, and we are working with them to come up with templates so that these individuals uh, can have a screening automatically uh, without anybody having to think about it. Okay, so finishing up uh, in the next couple of slides. Why bother diagnosing primary immune deficiency in the first place? Well, obviously, if we don't, it may be more expensive if we fail to diagnose and treat properly. It, it may cause more expensive complications, undue suffering, and of course, premature deaths in our patients. Further, I would argue that it is the physician's responsibility to diagnose and treat the patient to his or her best ability. In my opinion, we have only one constituent, and that is the patient. And then finally, how are we to judge our nation's healthcare system? Are we to provide the best care we can as physicians for our patients? The Japanese saying, okage sama de, I am what I am because our, of our ancestors, I would argue absolutely we have an obligation. So finishing up in the next couple of slides, words we can live by, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, you do unto me. I would argue that how we treat our elderly is how we treat ourselves. Quoting the great Maya Angelou, I think a hero is any person really intent on making this a better place for all people. I strongly subscribe to that. Uh, what do we need to do? We need to put our paddle in and join the effort. We need to recognize, we need to coordinate, we need to work with third party pairs. We need to know how to appropriately treat elderly patients with PID, anticipate the complications before they occur. Absolutely, we need to do research in this area that's needed. And this is one of my favorite slides. Let's help the ger geriatric patients rock and roll. I may be an old geezer, but I'm still a swinger. <laughs> and the one on the right, I, that's before my time. I, some of the audience might have to help me. I think that's the bop. You know, I'm the twist generation. So finally, as we say in Hawaii, mahalo nui loa, thank you, and ahui ho, which means until we meet again. Thank you so much, Dr. Kobayashi. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for that presentation. Unfortunately, we don't have time to take any questions. However, we did receive your questions and uh, we will work with Dr. Kobayashi to get answers to some of those questions. We did receive your email addresses with that and we'll make sure that you've got that. Dr. Kobayashi, as always, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, any final words for our audience? No, uh, I, I think the only thing is we need to recognize that immune deficiency can occur in adults and the older individuals and research is required, mandatory, to find out how best to treat these individuals. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kobayashi. Everyone, we look forward to seeing you at our next session uh, with Dr. Rudis in the auditorium and then later on at our IDF hangout and get together. We will see you soon and have a wonderful uh, remainder of your day.